All right, so I'm going to talk uh, not really about disease at all on this lecture, but it's more about climate, weather, and climate change data that a lot of you would use if you want to do some kind of um, um, disease research related to, to any kind of weather, climate, um, uh, or climate change uh, in particular. So I do apologize if you're a climatologist, because it's going to probably be really boring, because it's going to be kind of high level. I'm going to introduce you some forms of data that, uh, that you can get, like weather station data and remote sensing data, a little bit of how it works, and some of the advantages and disadvantages of it. And then kind of lastly, some, uh, talk about how you might use forecasting data, whether it be like a uh, weather forecast or kind of a climate change forecast, and some of the, the uh, uncertainty that's, um, that's uh, present with that. So I've already shown you this slide today, but I want to quickly do some definitions, because it's easy to kind of get bogged down on, well, what's the difference between weather and climate? Generally, we think of weather as the current atmospheric conditions in a particular location in time. So we tend to think of it being more local and, and very short term. So you might say the weather outside today is, I took a guess like a few months ago that it was going to be raining in Cape Town when I made this slide, but apparently I was wrong. <laughs> but, uh, but well, but uh, you know, um, You'd say, okay, it's raining outside, or it's, it's sunny outside, and it's you know 15 degrees Celsius. You wouldn't say the climate outside today is is this or that. So you're really kind of talking about the weekly and uh, da sorry the daily and up to kind of the weekly scale. This is also the scale that you'd make weather forecasts with about up to uh, about 10 days. So this differs from climate, which is kind of the long-term average conditions of the atmosphere over a region. So uh, where I went to graduate school in Arizona, we say it's an arid climate. It's very dry. They do have some seasonal precipitation. You wouldn't say that today the, you know, it's arid outside. You would say that over the long term, you tend to have um, uh, arid conditions. So it's usually related to temperature. Like, is it, do you have a warm season or cold season? Is it mild all the time? Um, do you have seasonal rains or do you have rains? Um, is it fairly uniform throughout the year? And then, uh, oops, so yeah. So when we talk about climate variability, we're actually talking about how climate fluctuates around its mean. Um, so and the same thing with weather too. So you don't have the same conditions every day. So if the average temperature here is uh, 20 degrees Celsius, it's not 20 degrees Celsius every day. Even if a particular, particular month has an average of 20 degrees Celsius, it's not average um, all the time. It fluctuates around it. And, uh, this can include uh, kind of phase changes. This is related to kind of like I talked about the El Nino Southern Oscillation and that can cause things. So you might get a fluctuation where you go into um, uh, kind of a higher uh, mean value and you kind of drop down to a lower mean value. This tends to average out over time. You also can have variations in the variation itself. So here you can see that we have kind of these small variations. It gets bigger and then gets smaller again. But this is kind of related to just climate variability. You wouldn't say this is climate change. This is just generally how the atmospheric works. So climate change refers to, refers to kind of a long-term alteration in the climate mean or, um, or the variation in the climate. Now this uh, could be natural or anthropogenic. So we do tend to talk about anthropogenic climate change related to emissions of greenhouse gases and, and other things. However, there's also natural variations in the climate as well. And so depending on what scale you go to, you can, you can kind of go back and forth between climate change and climate variability. So we do have periodic ice ages in, in our climate system. Those are just kind of natural. So in a particular, if you're on the edge of one of those uh, kind of shifts into a more, uh, to a colder, into an ice age, you might say, oh, the climate is changing. Or, but if you look over the long term, you could say, well, no, that's just variability. So there, there is some, um, uh, uh, it is a kind of a contentious issue. Now, we assume that there is some human-induced climate change, and we assume that we're responsible for it, and we generally refer to that as always being climate change, not just variability. What you see here, just kind of an example is, um, oh, this got messed up in the transition, but we tend to see this increase over time. So it's possible to have uh, fluctuations as well. So as you see, as this goes, this year down here might be colder than this year up here. That doesn't mean that climate change doesn't exist, right? It's kind of the trend over time in this upward curve that, that matters. And this can also uh, uh, be an issue that's difficult for some people to, to understand. They say, well, if climate change is occurring and we're getting warmer temperatures, why was last year you know, actually warmer than this year? Why is it cooler this year? And, uh, and it's, it's the trend that matters, not just any uh, one particular year or even just a few years. We also see increased variability as well. I kind of showed this yesterday, that under climate change, we also expect there to be more variability in extreme conditions, especially uh, things like precipitation. So now that we kind of understanding, uh, this understanding of, of kind of how climate works, and that we have weather, we have climate, and then we have climate change and climate variability, all slightly different things, uh, oftentimes we need data actually put into our models. So I'm going to talk about a, a few different sources of data. Uh, paleoclimate data, I'm going to talk briefly about it, but it's not something that's generally used in climate and health research that much. 
um, station data and recorders, satellite data, which is what NASA um, uh, is generally focused on, some reanalysis data sets and forecasting, and then I'm going to talk about uh, the use of climate change data as well. So paleoclimate data is, is any kind of past climate data. And you can kind of think of a station as being climate data. If you have a weather station, they, they uh, exist up to about 100 years into the past. But when we really talk about paleoclimate data, we're talking about um, obtaining records of the climate from, uh, from other means. So um, some examples are ice cores. Uh, you can see here where they actually go into certain areas, drill down the ice, and count the layers in the ice. Uh, and they can actually do analysis on it to see if there's air bubbles in it, what the chemistry of it was like, or if there's layers of um, uh, how thick the layers are can determine how much precipitation occurred. And from there, they can also determine things like temperature. There's tree rings. Most people are familiar with that in a lot of trees. Once you cut them down, if you look at the rings, you can tell how old the tree is. But you can also tell other things, like um, if there's burn marks, you can tell if there was maybe a fire that occurred during that time. The width of the rings mat uh, matters as well. So if it's, uh, they're wider, you could say there's more growth during that year. So it might have been warmer, it might have been wetter, uh, things like that. You can do some carbon analysis, too, to see what the uh, carbon levels were like as well. So there's a lot of things you can do with uh, 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 tree rings, which is generally called dendrochronology, is, is the study of uh, tree rings. There's also sediment cores. We would drill down to lakes and other things. And you can look at the sediment and the rocks, what the chemistry of those is like. Um, in various organisms like, um, uh, like fermerephrodids, which are small organisms that we can look at their chemistry and what they're made out of, especially if they have a shell on them, what's the silicon and what's the isotope uh, ratios like in that silicon. So you can um, think about the chemistry of the atmosphere or the water at the time. Um, but like I said, these are really used in climate and disease research because we're really talking about contemporary issues for the most part. We're not really concerned about necessarily what happened 500 or 1,000 years ago. Um, per se. That's not to say that it doesn't occur because, you know, there are things that are important in our history, like, uh, like plague, that we can look at and see, well, did climate change affect that a long time ago and so forth. But that's, uh, that's rarer. So what generally people think about when they think about data from weather is just weather station data. And uh, these instruments carry a, a lot of different, uh, so stations carry a lot of different instruments on them. And they can measure things like temperature, precipitation, humidity, wind speed, wind direction, uh, incoming solar radiation as well. What's important to note is that not all the weather stations are going to have all these instruments on them. Some of them do, some of them don't. You usually see temperature and precipitation are the ones you see the most often. And they're found oftentimes at airports. Most major airports have them. Sometimes universities have their own weather stations set up. Um, research centers themselves might have it all set up. Uh, and they're often collected by the, uh, some kind of national or local uh, weather service. So in the United States, we have the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and they have a whole network of, um, of uh, weather stations. A long time ago, they were actually monitored by people. People would go out each day and, and you know, read measurements on them and write them down. Nowadays, most of them or all of them are automated instead, uh, which makes them a little bit more reliable. So the strengths is that they have the ability to uh, um, calculate many variables or measure many variables. Uh, they often run at a daily resolution and oftentimes also at an um, hourly resolution as well. So you have pretty good resolution. Uh, most populated areas, the, bigger, the more populated areas, the more times you see them. This can be an advantage because um, lots of times if you're doing disease work, you're interested in areas where there's a lot of people. But it can be a disadvantage just because often areas where there aren't as many people, you tend to see less weather stations. It's not uniformly distributed. And they can have a long record history in some cases, some of them up to uh, and over uh, 100 years or so. But uh, there are some weaknesses. As I mentioned, they're not uniformly distributed. So you might be interested in knowing the temperature and precipitation in a particular location, and there be, might not be a weather station for you know, 50 miles of that. And, and therefore, you're not going to get good measurements for it. Even then, there's potential breaks in the recordings. So oftentimes, you can look at this data, and you'll find that there's just a month missing for some reason, or maybe just a couple days missing, or maybe there's like a 10-year period where it didn't exist, where they move the weather station from one area to the other. And if you move that weather station from one area to the other, you're actually disturbing you know, what kind of things it's measuring, especially if you're moving it up in uh, altitude or lower in altitude. And again, they're not representative of very large areas. So when you're getting that weather station, you're getting the weather in that particular location. Now, sometimes this is well representative of the areas around it. Um, if it's on a, you know, higher up on a hill, it's not. You know, if you go down that hill, it might not be that far away, but you might have significant lower temperatures because it's at a lower elevation. So you have to keep that in mind. And recently, we've seen that some data is extremely expensive to get. In some places, it's freely available, and anybody can get it. And this is the case for the most part in the United States. 
Um, in other areas, it's very expensive or almost impossible to get. And uh, I've heard some stories uh, from here in Africa of you know, people being charged tens of thousands of dollars to try to get data to do research. And most times, that's just, you know, that's not possible. Here's the uh, Global Historical Climatology Network uh, that's uh, developed by NOAA in the United States. Now, one interesting thing is this data is all freely available from many locations, but it only goes up to, I think, 2005. So if you have a data set that you only need weather data for between, um, I think it goes, goes pretty far back, I think that back even to the 1950s. Um, it probably depends on which weather station. Some of these go back further than others. Um, it's pretty good for that, but obviously if you need something in the last decade or so, then this isn't going to be very helpful. Uh, we have this other thing is called, uh, they sometimes called hobos. Hobo is actually a name of, the, of, of a company that makes um, some set of them, but they're kind of these mini data loggers, and they're almost um, kind of like a mini um, weather station. And they're good for collecting things like um, uh, temperature uh, and humidity. And they're just very small. What's neat about them is you could put them out somewhere. Like if you wanted to check out what, if you're doing a mosquito-borne disease per se, and you want to know what the temperatures are like in a particular bush where you have a mosquito trap and you're collecting mosquitoes. This is a great thing. They're very cheap. You can put it out there. You can leave them out there for months on end sometimes. And then you can come back and you can just hook it up to your laptop. Or some of them are even, um, uh, you can even use a kind of a, an internet connection. And you can just download that data. And you can set them often to whatever, um, time intervals you want. So you can say, I want the data collected every minute, every hour, every half hour, or, or whatever. So you can get a really fine data um, for one particular location. Uh, unfortunately, uh, most of the time, these are things you have to do yourself. And that actually can be a good thing sometimes. However, if you don't have the money to buy them or you don't have the manpower to set them out and collect them, that can be a little bit difficult. And generally, they only measure temperature and humidity. So if you're concerned about precipitation, you're probably going to have to go another route. Um, you can do things like uh, correlate humidity with precipitation if you want to, but that's not going to be uh, quite a perfect solution. But if you're really interested in just temperature, they're, they're very good for that. Are they expensive? No, no, not very expensive. These can, I mean, it depends. You can get more expensive ones or ones that are less expensive, but you can get them for, I wouldn't say if you can get like a single one for like even like just like 10 bucks or something. So sometimes people do, um, we did a study where we had like 40 or 50 of these just around the city. So instead of using a weather station where you can get, you know, maybe your city only has one weather station in the middle of it, that's only representative of that one area. You want to see what the variability is across the city. You can use these, spread them out all over the place and collect them and see how your temperature varies from one location to the other. And this might be important for, per for particular diseases like vector-borne diseases where one side of town that's at a higher elevation might have, have lower risk than an area that's uh, someplace lower, or someplace that's exposed to the sun more is warmer than someplace that's on the, uh, uh, well, depends what side you're on, whether the north or the south side of, of a hill, you might be getting less or more direct sunlight, and that could vastly affect your temperature. So they're pretty neat, pr pretty little, uh, not very expensive. Of course, you, just, you do have to set them out on your own if you want to use them. If you're trying to do research across the world, you better have a partner that's putting them out for you and collecting that data for you. Uh, so one thing NASA does a lot and which solves many problems uh, is remote sensing. So instead of making direct measurements, we're using a technique that collects information through a signal. And using remote sensing is generally electromagnetic radiation. What you do is you have these sensors with filters on them so they collect uh, radiation in certain wavelengths. So if you remember, you know, kind of your physics, you have anywhere from, and, and we collect it all kinds, anywhere from, um, it could be microwave to gamma rays, uh, visual, sorry, visible or infrared. And all these, uh, all these different wavelengths are important because features on Earth emit radiation at specific wavelengths, as you can see here. And so by collecting data at specific wavelengths, we can determine what, what the features of the Earth are down below it. Now there's two types generally that are used. There's active and passive remote sensing techniques. So passive only collects the signal coming up from the Earth. So you can think of, you know, <coughs> the land down here, the sun's uh, shining down on it, uh, the land's emitting uh, electromagnetic radiation at specific wavelengths, and the satellite's collecting it, and then it's sending it down to Earth where the data will be um, uh, processed and then made available. It's also active. We actually have a signal that's emitted by the satellite, and then it actually measures the return signal. Um, so there are two different types. Now the data you collect at very different levels of it. So um, when you see remote sensing data, they'll say, okay, do you want, you know, level one, two, three, and so forth. And that's at different levels of processing. 
So level zero is the raw data, which you probably will never see and probably should never look at it. And this is just the direct information that came down from the satellite. But that data needs to be processed and so forth. And so we can go to kind of, and these are rough, it depends on um, what satellite, what the levels actually mean, but generally the level one data has been calibrated for the satellite, okay? It's a little bit more robust. It's been geo-referenced to where that data was in time and space. At the second level, they actually make that information a measure of a specific variable, whether it's land surface temperature or, um, or something else. Uh, they'll then map it so it's on a uniform grid, so when you get the data, you can say, okay, I want uh, the grid that's covering um, Cape Town, I want to know what the surface temperature was, and you can get that de specific data. And there's another level where they actually model variables from it. So this is something like vegetation, like NDVI, where you actually have um, an index of the vegetation that's made up from other variables that the uh, satellite collects. So there's different levels of data, and whenever you collect this data, there's usually information about that, what level you need, what kind of data it is, what units are it's in, and so forth. So this is a quick video. This is showing, I think this is a Landsat, um, showing how they collect. These satellites revolve around the Earth, and as they revolve around the Earth, they're collecting um, uh, information on the ground. And so in this case, uh, to get the full swath of the Earth, it has to go around, I think, 17 times for Landsat. So you can see this is, here's Africa right here, actually. And so, and here you see the time. So about one day to go around uh, once, and then it's going to keep going around the Earth again, and again, and again. Um, let's see, well, there, day two, it keeps going. And we get to around day 17, we'll have a full, uh, there we go. So it's going, there's day five, six. And eventually we get to day 17, it'll have collected all the data on Earth, or for every area on the Earth. Eddie and 16, 17. So this satellite collects data on uh, the entire Earth every 17 days. Uh, so what you're interested in is, okay, what does it measure? And they do measure a lot of variables, and it depends on the satellite. So different, da different satellites have uh, different instruments on it. They collect things at different wavelengths uh, or in different frequencies. Uh, so we have things like for temperature, uh, things like ego stress, that's not going up till 2017. Um, Hispory, which is one they're getting ready, that won't go out till uh, 2020. But things like Aster, Landsat, and MODIS are currently, um, data from them are currently available. Uh, GPM stands for Global Preci Precipitation Measurements, um, and that measures precipitation. It went up in 2014. It replaced another satellite um, that was called TRIM, which is a tropical rainfall measurement mission. Uh, that satellite actually uh, finally stopped working um, last year. Uh, SMAP is for soil moisture, and it measures soil moisture in it. Now, SMAP actually stands for Soil Moisture Active Passive. Fortunately, they got the satellite up into space, and the active um, instrument on it doesn't work. And uh, that's actually something that is, unfortunately, fairly common, that you put a satellite up in space, you don't always get exactly what you want. Um, so right now, it's actually, it should be just SMA, but, uh, oh, sorry, SMP, but it's still named SMAP. And we have a few other ones. Uh, uh, they have ones that have hyperspectral, so they'll do um, multiple wavelengths or different chunks of wavelengths. Um, things can do structures, uh, flooding levels and water, or uh, land, use and land use change. Um, things like Landsat and MODIS are very popular for that. So some strengths of remote sensing is it measures uh, a lot of the state functions that are important to um, diseases, uh, specifically things like precipitation, is soil moisture is important, temperature, vapor pressure. From vapor pressure, you can get different measures of humidity. Um, solar radiation might be important. And from these, you can actually uh, get other measurements of the functions of an ecosystem uh, and learn about how the uh, land use, land use changes. Sometimes you can even um, determine different types of vegetation, especially that vegetation is important for a specific disease or the ecology of a, of a, of a certain reservoir or a vector, uh, things like that. It provides things in a spatial context, so it's not just a one-point measurement. These measurements are usually global or fairly close to global, so you can see not just what's happening right in one area, like a weather station, you can see what's happening directly nearby to you, so it puts things in spatial context. And of course, it provides this kind of um, time series measurement, so it's not just a measurement at one time, in space, it keeps going over and over again at a very uh, uniform rate. So you've got a kind of a constant, uh, sorry, a consistent um, measurements over time. But of course, like anything, there's, there's some weaknesses as well. 
So there's usually a trade-off between spatial and temporal resolution. And so we saw Landsat, it took about 17 days to collect um, data everywhere on Earth. Um, that can be good for depending on your measurements, but if you need something daily, that's not very good. Um, so you can either have good spatial resolution, like Landsat's very good, I think it's about, depending on what variable, it could be 60 or even 30 meters. However, it's every 17 days. You can contrast something like MODIS. So MODIS actually, uh, there's an instrument on two satellites, so it travels uh, across each place on the Earth twice daily. So then you have a measurement twice per day there. However, um, you're at about a one kilometer resolution instead of about, um, this is for Landsat 7, uh, about 60 um, meters instead. So you can either get good spatial resolution or good temporal resolution. You're generally not going to get both. Uh, now, related to that is there's things like atmospheric inter interference. So certain types of electromagnetic radiation are going to be absorbed by the atmosphere, especially when there's clouds and they're going to get in the way. This can be you know, a problem if you're, you know, you're looking for Landsat images. So you want to get one. You say, OK, they're every 17 days. That's still not too bad. But what if on that day that you need it, it's really cloudy and you can't get the measurement that you needed? All of a sudden, it goes from you know, every 17 day to every you know, 34th day. And it could happen that, that you know, the second measurement also is obscured by clouds. So that becomes an issue as well. Uh, obviously, these aren't perfect either. So we're not making a direct measurement. We're taking it from electromagnetic radiation from the Earth. And there's all kinds of correction algorithms they use. But none of them are going to be perfect. So even when you look at the land use patterns um, by something like, um, um, like Landsat, it might not be perfect. It might classify something as rain, like you know, grasslands when it should be forests and vice versa. But they're a good approximation. Now, NASA provides all of their data free. And they actually have a lot of programs to make sure that that data is, uh, is free and that people have access to it. But that's not true of a lot of other, uh, other space agencies, especially in Europe. They'll charge large amounts of money for them. But luckily, NASA is obviously the best one because I work for them. So <laughs> we provide it to everybody. All right, so another thing you can use is reanalysis data sets. So this is a little bit different. Reanalysis data sets combine um, modeling techniques along with data simulation, actually observations, to create, um, to create a data set of a particular variable uh, over time. And um, um, they're very good because you don't just need, they're kind of, they're gridded and they're consistent. So you have you know, the same variable, well, they have multiple variables every single day at the same resolution as opposed to most observations, including remote sensing observations, where you don't always have those consistently. There might be you know, a day where um, it doesn't exist. Uh, there's multiple sources for them. NASA has uh, one called GLDAS, which is Global Land Data Simulation Systems. NSEP has one of the first one. They have something called the Reanalysis Project, uh, where they do this. These data sets are usually available from the 1970s, 80s, uh, up to the present. Um, so they have just like I said, they cloud a huge amounts of variables. Because they're partially a model data set, they include everything that a global climate model would, which would be like atmospheric pressure, uh, moisture, precipitation, temperature, almost any variable that you could possibly need. And they're good because they're not just model data sets, they incorporate <coughs> observations into them. And by incorporating observations into them, it, it provides some kind of a correction to it. And a lot of them are, are free, and they're relatively easy to loot relatively easy to use. The biggest, I'd say, um, uh, problem is can you get them in the right format? Usually they come in something called a net CDF format. Um, and there's a lot of tools. I think an R has tools, um, Python has tools, MATLAB. If you use any of those data products, there's tools to help uh, read that type of data. So this, this, uh, sorry, some of the disadvantages uh, is the reliability is, is dependent on locations and specific variables. So temperature is usually a very uh, accurate variable. Something like precipitation is not so accurate. Um, because they use observations, if you have a place that has lots of observations, they're going to be more accurate. If you're in an area that they don't have as many observations, it might not be as accurate because you don't, and that's accurate because you don't have that data to help uh, correct the model. Uh, they're also going to change over time as well because they might be using observations from satellites. Now, satellites uh, are a relatively new phenomenon, and our number in the improvement of satellites have increased over time. And so data from the 1980s isn't going to have as good or as much satellite data incorporated into it as something you know, in the last decade. So that'll vary. And again, it is model data, so it's not perfect. It is anchored using observational data, which is um, very helpful. But still, um, like almost any of that data set there, it's not going to be quite perfect. So I'm going to talk about 
that's kind of using data from the past. So if you're going to do some kind of study retrospectively. But you also might want to look into the future, too. And there's a couple different um, uh, uh, time scales that we could look into the future. The first would be generally using a weather forecast. And these are kind of short-term predictions that generally are from you know, right now up to about 10 days into the future. After about 10 days, they tend to degrade uh, quite rapidly. And they're usually done by meteorologists. You might see them on TV. And they use several methods. This first is the current observations. So they look at, all right, what is the temperature? What's the precipitation like? Or um, what's the uh, moisture in the atmosphere look like? They use radar, other things. Um, they track weather patterns and weather masses. They also use uh, forecasting models, which these are short-term models. They like global climate models only um, for the current weather that go up to about seven to 10 days into the future. And then just experience, too. So most weather forecasters, especially if they've been around an area for a long period of time, they look at the models, say they look at the observations, and they look at just general experience, like what do they generally observe? If there's a wet air mass coming in from the south, does it generally come straight there? Does it usually um, go around Pacific terrain? Uh, so they use all of these three things when they make their weather forecasts. So there's multiple sources for it. There's, uh, you know, your local weather. Um, there's some private companies. I tend to go to weatherunderground.com quite a bit. They have a lot of data available, and uh, they have data available for uh, all over the, uh, uh, the country. Uh, so, or sorry, all over the world. Um, so some considerations is, is there's a lot of uncertainty in weather, especially as you go um, further into the future. So what this graph is showing you uh, is a couple of things. So this is the forecasting skill on the y-axis. So this is how good the forecasts are. And this is kind of the year on the, uh, the x-axis. And what you see um, is it generally increases in time. We've gotten a little bit better with our forecasts. Now, the different colors represent how far into the future they are. So the day three, this blue is the day three forecast. And you see its skill is much better than, say, the day seven forecast, and a lot better than, say, the day 10 forecast. So like I said, if you're going to use forecast data for your prediction of a, maybe a particular disease, you have to think about how far in the future you want to go. If you want to go 10 days out, you're really seeing, you know, this is about 40% skill level. So it's very uncertain if you're going to try to use this data uh, into the future. And you're going to have then two, um, uh, two sources of error. First, your model might be, have some error associated with it, but also the data you're feeding it is also going to have some uh, error associated with it as well. Um, so keep that in mind. The further you go out, uh, generally the forecast is going to degrade in quality. Um, we have seasonal forecasts as well. These are a little bit different. When you do a seasonal forecast, you're not necessarily trying to say, I think that, you know, if next month on, let's say, like June 3rd, it's going to be 14 degrees Celsius. You might see that for the weather forecast. You're not going to see that for a climate forecast. Uh, what they're generally doing when they do these seasonal forecasts is looking at long-term climate trends. They're going to look at things like uh, the surface, uh, uh, sea surface temperatures, things that affect the climate in that area. Uh, and they're going to use um, some other kind of prediction tools and everything to make their forecast. So here's kind of a, an example. And you can see um, this is just showing probability uh, of things to occur. So, you know, if you're in uh, Brazil here, this is saying that there's about a 60% chance of below normal um, precipitation, all right? So it's not a direct forecast. It's not going to tell you exactly how much rain there is. It's going to tell you whether it's likely to be wet or dry or roughly. Uh, and there's several examples of this. There's the North American Multimodel Ensemble. There's the MMME. And this actually uses a bunch of, I think it's, it's more than 28, but at least 28 uh, different models. I think even up to 100 that they put together to come up with some kind of forecast into the future. Now, they're generally not daily. These are generally given at the monthly format. Um, they do have. Um, for this MME data, a tool that you can get uh, on the internet, it's actually free, um, we can get downscaled so it's about 0.5 degree resolution and it's daily. Now it's important to remember that this daily temperature data that you might get for three months in the future isn't an actual prediction of what the temperature is going to be on that day. It's generally a scenario that is likely to occur. So um, it might have daily temperature for June. It's basically just showing the general, the way the climate generally works in that um, during that month. So climate change is, is you know, one of the big topics in this conference, uh, or this workshop. Uh, I've shown this slide before, uh, but it's basically just to kind of reiterate why we're concerned about climate change, uh, increasing in temperature um, and increasing in variability. Um, and this is important for many um, uh, uh, diseases, as you've uh, heard throughout the, uh, throughout the workshop. So generally, we look at our climate change data from climate, uh, global climate models. And these kind of global climate models, they attempt to simulate the climate through kind of mathematical equations. 
They look at both the physics, the chemistry, and the biological processes that make up our, our Earth system, which includes not just the atmosphere, but the biosphere, the lithosphere, um, uh, and the hydrosphere. Now, there's many different models. We have uh, generally the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which puts out a lot of this data, this climate change data, runs about 28 to 29 models. And it's important because all those models have different parameterizations, they work at different resolutions, uh, they have different uh, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, sometimes they're better at one particular location than another at, uh, at simulating the climate. And here's kind of a kind of 3D representation of how they work. This is how they see the Earth. It's kind of like a 3D grid. And they look at what's happening in each of these cells and how it affects the cell next to it. And because of this, this includes a lot of computing power because there's a lot of equations used. And even if it's a fairly simple equation, it has to be done for every single cell both in the, um, especially for the atmosphere, both in the vertical direction and in the horizontal directions as well. So we generally like high resolution models, however, they use a lot more computing power. And what's nice about them is, depending on how you parameterize them, you can look at how the Earth or the climate system would work under different conditions. So when they do climate change, when you run these models under climate change conditions, you have different forcings, like things like greenhouse gases and aerosols and, and pollutant concentrations. You put that in the model and you run it under those conditions and you see what happens to the climate. Now this isn't easy to do because you have to be able to know, okay, what do you think the greenhouse gas, gas concentrations are going to be two decades into the future? We wouldn't have measurements for that. We have to take our best guess. And unfortunately, greenhouse gas emissions are largely dependent on human behavior, which is extremely unpredictable. So to, kind of compensate for this, we come up with these things called representative, representative concentration pathways. And basically, these are scenarios for particular um, um, socioeconomic conditions uh, that they think will occur into the future. So you'll have actually uh, many different types of, of scenarios they'll run. And here's kind of an example. Uh, so these representative concentration pathways, there's, here's four different ones with different assumptions. So they have different populations. You can see uh, this is RCP. Was it 4.5? I think um, assumes a higher concentration of pe or sorry, a higher number of people than some of the other models, and from that we get uh, things like the amount of greenhouse gas emissions we 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 think will occur. So we take those different emission scenarios, put them into the model, run the model onto the future, and see what we get for temperature. And again, this is designed to deal with uncertainty. So when you do your work, you don't you don't have to just guess one scenario. You can say, okay, I'm going to run it for multiple scenarios. Um, because I'm not sure what's exactly going to happen into the future. Now, as I said, these models, we'd like them to run at uh, higher resolutions, but that takes more computer processing power. So usually they're run at rather coarse uh, resolutions, but oftentimes you want data at a, at a much smaller resolution. So we do something called downscaling, which is we, we estimate the local climate from kind of these uh, larger scale models. And this is important, especially for local impact assessment. If you have a really big grid cell, you want to know what's happening in Cape Town, but the grid cell is the size of South Africa, that might be a problem. You want to downscale it to the local climate. And there's general two methods for doing this. There's dynamic downscaling and statistical downscaling. So dynamic downscaling is really kind of a nested uh, model. So you have a very similar model to your global climate model. It's a weather model. You take the boundary conditions, so what's happening in the atmosphere over the whole grid cell, and you use those as input into a model that's run in a much smaller grid cell. Um, so, so, you, you basically take, let's suppose you've got a hundred, you've got yeah. a cell that's measuring over a hundred square kilometers, and you'd yeah. like to have it over one square kilometer, and you've got, you, you take the boundary conditions for the hundred square kilometers. Yeah, so I'm talking about the boundary atmospheric conditions in, in that sense. So what's going on in that cell? What's, what's the pressures like? What's the, um, um, uh, all those other kind of conditions that are important, and you use those as inputs into the uh, kind of, the, they call it RG, RGCMs, regional uh, global climate, regional general circulation models, but yeah, climate models at a smaller level. And so you use those kind of inputs, so you're kind of just nesting the model. Would that be a fair representation of what is, yeah. So um, does that make sense? So it's just, yeah, you're going from one level to, to another level. Mm -hmm. But you need that bigger model to first get those bigger conditions before you can use them as input into the, uh, the more localized model. I think you should rather use probably like average, so, so the results, mm -hmm. yes, because it doesn't make sense for me actually to take boundary conditions and shift from, for example, from 100 by 100 grid to, let us say, 1 by 1 grid. Mm -hmm. But if you solve an equation, let us say, in a bigger 
uh, domain, the new average somehow this, and then you use the average as a boundary condition for a smaller something. Like yeah, that, yeah, yeah, very kind of similar to that. Yeah, you have to, and again, it's not perfect, but it's, what are some of the advantages is when you're doing that, those conditions, you're still using the mechanistic processes that are known for the atmosphere to, to run that, that smaller model. Um, there's obviously uh, some kind of problems with it. It's, it's, it can be very, um, they can be highly complex and they require a lot of computing power. Um, so they're not generally not used, I think, as much as statistical techniques because of that. Um, uh, but it's important because it doesn't, it doesn't really rely on, on past climate data anyway, so anybody can, can well, I wouldn't say anybody, but if you have the right computing power, you can go from that large scale to that smaller scale just using your knowledge about the atmosphere and your equations about the atmosphere. But it does have some disadvantages, so it does have high computing power. Um, and even, no matter how small scale we go with these models, some processes we just, we can't model, we just have to parameterize them. And a good example of this is kind of uh, how precipitation is, is created in clouds. Um, these are, you know, tiny, 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 like microscopic processes. And no matter how, you know, if you were able to do a model at that level, it would be almost completely worthless because you'd be doing it for such a small, small area. So it's, it's still not to, able to simulate all of those processes. And it relies on the accuracy of the GCM, like I said. So if your GCM, your global climate model, isn't doing a good job at the bigger level, it's probably a good bet that at the smaller level, at the regional climate model, it's also not going to have a, a very good prediction either. So the method is statistical techniques. And this is just kind of basing the relationship on, between these large-scale atmospheric processes and what's going on at the local level. Here I have just kind of a, a real, real simple um, example. Um, in this case, the green line represents the um, a simulation that was run um, for the present conditions. The red represents a, uh, uh, an example of uh, a simulation under future conditions. And you basically look at, okay, how different are those? And then you add those differences to the blue line, which would be the, um, uh, the present conditions, and that the present observations, and that gives you kind of an idea of what the future observations will be. Now, this is a very simple example. Like, it doesn't account for um, variability, uh, so this is assume it's just an average moving. It doesn't account for the variability shifts um, or the fact that the simulation might not be completely accurate, but they do have more uh, advanced statistical techniques that will work for that. But in this case, you're just using a statistical technique. What's the larger scale um, atmospheric conditions compared to the local atmospheric conditions and applying that to the um, model output. Um, so some of the, di so this is obviously, it's very, it's a lot easier to do, requires a lot less power. Um, you can downscale right to a, a single point. Um, and uh, there's a lot of different methods you can use of different um, uh, compl complexity and everything. Of course, it assumes that these relationships are stable over time. So just because there's a specific relationship now, it doesn't mean that relationship is going to last between the local and the, in the, in the wider um, atmosphere into the future. So if you say, okay, generally our simulations show that you know, Cape Town is generally one degree warmer than the bigger box around South Africa. That might not be true 10 years into the future, per se. So it does have that disadvantage. Um, some of the methods are better than others. They account for things better than other methods do. And of course, your accuracy relies on not just the um, global climate model and how, well that, how accurate that is, but also you need historical data to compare it to. So if you don't have good historical data to compare uh, your your um, observations to what the climate models are saying, it's really hard to use a stati statistical technique. So that could be a, a disadvantage. If you don't have good historical data, it's very difficult to um, use any kind of statistical downscaling technique. Um, so a couple of things that, to consider when you do uh, kind of climate health related research. Uh, the resolution is important, so it depends on what kind of research you're gonna do. If you're gonna do something for a, a specific point, um, you know, you want to know what's happening right here, you might use a data logger or a weather station. Um, if you're talking about the city, you might use a weather station or some kind of remote sensing data or reanalysis data. And if you're looking at an even bigger scale, um, generally weather stations aren't going to do it. You're going to need some kind of reanalysis or remote sensing data set. So depending on what spatial scale you're at, it's going to determine what kind of data you're going to use. Also important is um, uh, to think about temporal resolution. So the thing about your temporal resolution is that if you need something at the monthly level, as long as you can get at the daily level, you, the daily level, you can just scale that up to the monthly level. You can't do the opposite. If you have your data, if you need data at the daily level and you only have it at the monthly level, you can use statistical techniques to to, to get it down there. But it's it's not as as easy. So you got to think about what's your application, what um, temporal and spatial scales you need the data at. You also have to think the period of study. So you remember that a lot of these techniques. Um, 
for collecting data have varied over time, both the number of things like weather stations and satellites has changed over the time, and the technology has changed over time as well. So you can think of things like satellites are, are kind of basically the 1980s and, and, and beyond is when you're going to have satellite data. If you want to get satellite data for the 1960s, you're generally out of luck. Uh, weather stations tend to be a little bit longer. They um, uh, generally from around 1900 is kind of the, uh, or sorry, I'd say, um, uh, yeah, around 1920, actually there's 1890s, I think there's some stations around the 1890s, but that's kind of the beginning of, of those observations. So if you want to go before that, you're probably going to have to do some kind of, um, uh, look at some kind of um, paleoclimate data. But those generally go up to the future, uh, sorry, go out, to, go out to the present time. Uh, and of course, you've got to think about that some of these weather, sta or sorry, weather, these weather stations, some of them um, have increased in number or decreased in number over time, so they're, they're, the number of them has, has changed quite a bit. When you want to look at data into the future, uh, if you're looking at a short-term forecast, you really want to use kind of a weather forecast. If you're looking like today to about seven to ten days in the future, you're looking at a weather forecast. If you're looking for seasonal, like months into the future, you want to use a seasonal forecast. And if you're looking for like long-term, multi-years, decades, you're looking at uh, some kind of uh, climate change data. And for almost all of these, you're going to understand that as you go into the future, your, um, uh, your ability to forecast is going to, um, uh, uncertainty is going to increase. So again, the weather forecasts for tomorrow and the next day are pretty good compared to seven or eight days from now. And once you go past about nine or ten days, these forecasts are almost completely worthless. Uh, and same thing even for climate change data. So the next decade or two we're pretty good with because we have an understanding of what the CO2, le CO2 level is going to be like. At 2080, 2090, or 2100, we really have no idea how humans are going to change their behavior. Are there going to be more of us? Are there going to be less of us? Are we going to adopt methods to decrease greenhouse gas emissions, or are we not going to do that? So there's a lot more uncertainty involved. So of course, one of the big questions is how you deal with uncertainty. And, um, and of course, from this kind of studies, when you're looking at climate and, and disease, there are, there are multiple methods of uncertainty. Um, but just from a climate perspective, from a climate model perspective, you have uh, model parameterization, which is one uncertainty. Um, you have the general accuracy of the model. Do your equations really fit what the atmosphere is doing? And then just um, uh, your data accuracy in general. Are you coming out with the right solution? So how do you how do you deal with this? Well, general methods, uh, some methods to deal with it are just, first of all, sl selecting the appropriate model or data. So if you're trying to figure out what climate, uh, general climate model you want to use for your particular location, you can look at how accurate they are. So certain climate models do better in certain locations. So one climate model might do really well over South Africa, but it might not do very well over um, Tucson, Arizona. Okay, so that's important. You try to select models that do well for your particular location. You can also run your, uh, use models that use different parameterizations um, uh, and different data sets. So we look here, here's um, the concentration pathways. We have about four of them. And these are the four ones. We have the purple, uh, orange, green, and uh, I guess that's purple. Maybe that's pink line here. Um, and you see these little squiggly lines around them all represent different models. So if you want to really know what's going on for, let's say, you want to predict malaria into the future, you say, OK, I'm not sure which climate data to use. One method is to use um, multiple models and multiple scenarios. And gen then you have not just kind of one prediction, you have a bunch of predictions in the future. And you look at the range of those predictions and uh, look at where they overlap and where the extremes are. And you kind of make your prediction based on, based on that data. Uh, you always want to evaluate predictions, too, when possible. So if you make a prediction two years from now, um, look and see, OK, two years from now, when you have data for that, you look at how well it works. And did something not work that you can need to change in the future? Or did it did work? Did it work? And then you want to continue that um, going forward. And when you do report your data, uh, sometimes it's good to report ranges of it. So to report, OK, what happens when I use the, uh, the 2.6 scenario compared to what happened when I use the RCP 8.5 scenario? And what happened when I use you know, one climate model versus another climate model? All right, so you can see that range and, and look at what the uncertainty is like. And I think that's it. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much for keeping the time. Okay. It's good training from NASA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, any questions, comments? Are the climate models equipped to handle extreme events like El Nino? Or some of them, yes. So they're getting a little bit better at, um, I think some of them do a pretty decent job with El Nino now, right? Or is it still all over the place? 
I think they see the signal kind of, but it's not like a, a really strong, they, Well, I think their assumptions are changed on how that physics. So there's a whole lot of assumptions based on this, especially when you get to things like clouds, which are very tiny scale. They have to make some kind of assumptions about it. So that changes. The resolution changes. So if you have, you know, in both time and so it might be, you know, not only the spatial resolution, it could be one kilometer, well, not one kilometer, it could be like one degree versus a half degree versus two degrees. But also the amount in the vertical resolution also matters. Do they assume that there's like, you know, 10 levels to the atmosphere or do they break it up into 20 levels? That's going to change everything as well. So they have a lot of different assumptions. Not all of them include the same variables. Some of them include a lot of land cover variables. Some maybe not so many land cover variables or biotic feedbacks and things like that. Um, so I think that's really, it's not the basic, basic physics that changes. It's just how do they assume it? How do they parameterize for specific, um, specific phenomenon that they can't explicitly model? Hey, John? Now, just a question about um, going from the general to the particular. So you've got a global, global China change model, mm -hmm. I'm working in a place where I've got 65 years worth of data, and I have a, a particular pattern, and I can sort of do a regression or whatever, and sort of say, this is the way in which uh, temperature is changing here. If I now want to use a global uh, you know, change model and apply that to my particular place, how would I proceed with that? Because that, that global change is basically saying I'm going to change across mm -hmm. uh, in, in the whole world. But I would assume that you can yeah so, yeah, so the climate models are broken down, you know, spatially um, into like smaller grid cells. So if you're a particular location, there will be a grid cell over your location okay. where it'll have numbers. Now, one thing I didn't mention, I should have that, they don't just run them to the future, they, they, they run them, they don't run them backwards, but they run them from the past into the future. So you have a historical period and then a future period. And you use that historical period, you could say, and this would be a good way for you to evaluate it. You can say, okay, at my location, um, here's what I have for, for measurements. You have your 60 years of measurements, and you compare that to the historical runs for the climate models. You can say, okay, which one of these models does the best job of replicating um, my data? And that might be the best model to choose to use um, in its future predictions. And that's generally what you like to do. You like to use a model that's, that, if you can, test it so that it's well representative of the area that you're in. And how far back did those uh, historically do that go now? 1900, right? No, and partial of it is that that first hundred years is really just as it's just supposed to be kind of rep it's it's used for a kind of comparison. So a lot of times you'll see people say, okay, things in comparison to like 1970 or 2000, and, and that's why that's a, it's not their goal isn't really to to simulate what happened like two or three or four hundred years ago. It's really to say, okay, this last century, we, are we doing a good job of simulating it? If we are, then we can trust our kind of projections into the future. And so I think that's why that hundred years is the most important. If it can simulate something 400 years ago, that's really not important for it knowing what's going to happen into no, the future. I just wondered if the data were actually there. I'm not sure if they've actually. I'm sure there's the actually. Yeah. Celsius yeah. degree is probably 19th century. You know, the concept of degree of oh, temperature yeah. is probably uh, 19th century, possibly. Oh, I'm not Fahrenheit sure. Fahrenheit Celsius, actually, there are probably 19th century people. Yeah. yeah so. so, so I mean, I, don't, I wonder actually if it was the concept of temperature yeah. in, in sort of like Newton time. Well, they can do it, and they use, like, climate records, they use other, so they, yep. if, you know, if you wanted data for what was the temperature like in Europe over a specific time period, they use things like tree ring records and stuff like that, so it wouldn't be a direct, obviously, it wouldn't be like a measurement with yeah, a right, thermometer. Yeah. Commenting on Greenwich, 
So, so oh, okay. if they connected, collected some, some data actually in what units, what very uh, units of temperature yeah. in Newton's time, I'm not sure. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fahrenheit was 18th century. 18th century. But still, I mean, post Newton. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, I think they, they do do that. They look at, um, can, they compare them the ones before to make sure. And so when, when they put satellites up, so if you put like Landsat 4 up, you have to make sure 5 goes up for a while. They want to be up for a while yeah. before Landsat 4 goes down so they can make comparison and calibrations of them. They do that on purpose. They don't, like uh, GPM, I talked about the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, went up in 2014. And luckily, TRIM, which, is the, it, which was the kind of one before it, went up, uh, went, came down, or it was decommissioned in 2015, which basically means it just crashed. Well, it didn't crash, it burned up in the atmosphere. But anyway, um, so it, you had some overlap. It was, wasn't exactly as much um, uh, overlap as they wanted, but there was some. That way they can calibrate them, so it's, it's a more continuous record without, like you said, there's not big changes because they calibrate the instrument to the one before it. So if I, let's say I want to do land use change analysis from 1980, if I download Lancet from uh, NASA, I don't need to do any correction? No, I don't think so. I think they, they do it mostly for you. They do all the, the processing. Yeah. Now, the, the one issue you might run into is, um, is the, in, the resolution of the instrument sometimes changes. So you might have to go from like 60, kilometer to 30 or 40 or, or, or something like that. So you could just, you would just scale up to whatever the, the um, But in bands, there's no problem with the different bands. You know, from the um, set, um, CM to lens that we have now, mm -hmm. they are different bands. I don't need to do any correction. No, 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 no. no. That, that I think, I'm pretty sure that's all, that's all standardized. It would, just, it would be just like, you just don't expect that the past one's going to have the same resolution as the current one, just because just because they probably improve the instrument in some way. Maybe you can process then you You process until you extract all the objects. Yeah, you can process. Yeah, it's also a good idea. You with any kind of remote sensing data, you want to ground truth it if you have you know data available. If you want to just plain out trust it. So you basically, if you have an image, let's say you're looking at tree cover or something like that, you obviously want to have some things going out there and at different sites and making sure that that what the satellite image is showing is also what you're seeing on the ground. They call it ground truthing. It's just basically a validation process. Mm -hmm. And you can do that if it's land use, land use. If it's, if it's temperature and precipitation, you can do it with like a, a measurements from a, uh, from a weather station or something like that. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay. Okay.